All right, everyone, let's spend a couple minutes reviewing what we did on Friday. Uh, on Friday, we started talking about dynamics. Dynamics was a study of motion with regard to what causes the motion, as opposed to kinematics, our last unit, which was the study of motion without regard to what causes the motion. In other words, the difference between last unit and this unit, we're studying the motion now, but paying attention to the forces that cause the motion, as opposed to just looking at the motion itself. What's a force? If we're studying forces, and we're talking about forces that cause motion, can you tell me what a force is? Everybody knows this, right? Bo, what's a force? Yeah, well, careful with that. I think, I think you're thinking the right thing and just not quite saying it perfectly correct. It's not something that pushes or pulls. It is the push or the pull. So if I push something, I'm the something that's pushing it, right? That's not a force. I'm not a force. The force is my push. So a force is a push or a pull. Now, we learned on Friday as well that there's two things that a force can do, and only two things that a force can do. What's one of those two things? Chase, what's one of those two things that a force can do? Uh, yes, it can cause acceleration. Now, included with that are a number of different things. If it causes acceleration, it can cause an object to speed up. What else can it do? It can cause an object to, what goes along with speed up? Slow down, good. Besides causing an object to speed up or slow down, it could cause an object to start or stop, which is kind of the same thing. But it could also cause an object to change, not speed, but uh, still part of acceleration here, direction. It can cause an object to change direction. All of those things fit within an acceleration. So forces cause acceleration. In other words, forces cause objects to speed up, slow down, or change direction. Now, what's the other thing besides an acceleration that a force can do? Or it can change the shape of an object, or it can deform an object. Anything that kind of means the same thing as deform an object. Okay, when I push on a basketball, okay, I hold the basketball in, in my hand and, I, and uh, I push it against the wall and I push on that basketball, I'm not causing that basketball to accelerate, not at all, but I am causing that basketball to deform. Even if I push on the wall here, hey, right now I'm pushing on the wall with my hand, that wall doesn't accelerate. It's not going anywhere. That wall, rather, is deforming. Now, it's not deforming much, maybe not even a noticeable amount, but if it's not accelerating, then it must be deforming because those are the two things that a force can do. Tell me what a net force is. What's a net force? We talked, remember the analogy we gave on Friday? Gross salary versus net salary. The net is the, the total, good, the total force. If we add all of the forces together, some of them are positive, some of them are negative. We add all the forces together, we get our net force or our unbalanced force. Another term, inertia. Inertia, we always, uh, in junior high, we always saw the intro to the Bill Nye, the Science Guy videos, and says, inertia is a property of matter. Um, speaking of Bill Nye, I got voted off uh, Dancing with the Stars last week, right? In a, in a crushing moment, he got voted off of Dancing with the Stars, which, yes, he was. Incredibly disappointing. Apparently, he hurt himself and got voted off after three episodes. It's on YouTube. Look it up. Um, what is inertia beyond being a property of matter? I mean, that's kind of describing it, but it's not really telling us what it is. Rucker, what's inertia? Uh, you're partly right. Rucker said the tendency of an emotion of an object to stay in mo that's in motion to stay in motion. And the last acted upon by now an unbalanced force. That's partly right. Um, can you give me a, a, a slightly more general answer to that, though, Hayden? Good. A tendency to resist a change in motion. So, Rutger, that accounts for what you said as well. You said a tendency to keep going, to stay in motion. Well, that object that's in motion has a tendency to resist a change in motion. But what other objects have a tendency to resist a change in motion? Not only objects that are moving, but... Objects that are, Tara? Yeah, objects that are at rest, objects that are stationary. 
Okay, an object that has a mass of 20 kilograms that's moving doesn't want to stop. It wants to keep moving at the same velocity, the same speed in the same direction. An object that's 20 kilograms at rest wants to stay at rest. It doesn't want to start moving. In fact, that 20 kilogram object has the same inertia whether it's moving or not. It has the ten same tendency to resist a change in motion whether it's moving or not. In other words, inertia is dependent upon what? One thing, one and only one thing. What is it? Mass. The heavier something is, the more inertia it has. The lighter something is, the less inertia it has. Equilibrium now. Equilibrium is a balance, right? In the context of forces, it's balanced forces. Can you tell me, anyone please, what static equilibrium means versus translational equilibrium? Balanced forces. Static balanced forces versus translational balanced forces. What does the word static mean? Not moving. So not moving balanced forces. An object th that is at rest may have one force, may have two forces acting on it, may have no forces acting on it, it may have 17 forces acting on it. But if it's at rest, it's in static equilibrium, and all of those forces end up balancing out. So that the net force is zero. Translational equilibrium is the equilibrium experienced by an object that's moving at a constant velocity. If it's moving at a constant velocity, it means it has, might have forces acting on it, but they're all balanced. The net force would be zero. Does that make sense? Okay, an object is moving down <coughs> a curling rock, is sliding down the ice at a, at a, say, at a velocity of uh, four meters per second. That curling rock may have forces acting on it. Okay. But if it's moving at a constant speed of 4 meters per second, then those forces are going to be balanced. If it speeds up, or if it slows down, that's when we have an unbalanced force, and that's when we're not in translational equilibrium. Finally, Newton's first law, also known as the law of inertia. Uh, Rutger already said half of it when he was talking about inertia, right? He said, an object in motion will stay in motion in a straight line, at a constant speed until acted upon by an unbalanced force or acted upon by a net force other than zero. The second aspect to it says an object at rest will, it's going to stay at rest forever, forever until acted upon by an unbalanced force. Is that okay? Good? We had five questions for homework last night. Uh, questions one to four, and question six. Which ones do we need to go over here? One. Uh, any others besides number one? That it? That's it? In your own words, state Newton's first law. I told you it was... An object in motion stays in motion in a straight line at a constant velocity until acted upon by an unbalanced force. An object at rest stays at rest until acted upon by an unbalanced force. Do you have a better way to say it or even just uh, a way that's just as good but in different way, different words? I have one. If you don't. I was just going to say for this question, an object wants to keep doing what it's doing. If it's at rest, it wants to stay at rest. If it's moving, it wants to stay moving. A straight line, constant speed. An object wants to keep doing what it's doing unless there's an outside force, an unbalanced force. Good. We have no other issues with any of these questions. All right, excellent. We're going to have ourselves a quiz on Newton's... Newton's first law, forces, inertia, all that little stuff that we did on Friday, we'll have ourselves a quiz on that tomorrow, right? So uh, be ready for that tomorrow. We're going to move on now to something called Newton's second law, but we're going to kind of get there over the next couple minutes. 
acceleration given by the symbol A, given by the units, meters per second squared. You guys know what that means. We talked about that in our first unit. We just didn't talk about what caused the acceleration, that's all. Acceleration depends upon two things. Can anybody tell me what they think acceleration depends upon? In other words, what's going to affect acceleration? What's going to make acceleration greater or smaller? Yeah, give me one thing. The force. Not just the force, but the net force. Okay? If we say just the force, then look, I push on a desk here. Okay, push on Maddie's desk, doesn't move. Well, the acceleration of that desk did not depend upon the force that I applied. Because I applied a force, the desk didn't move. The acceleration didn't depend upon the force that I applied. It depended upon the net force. And the net force when I pushed on Maddie's desk was still zero because friction was countering it. Right? If I push on Maddie's desk and I start moving that desk, and there's friction acting the other way, the amount of acceleration that it experiences will depend upon the net force or the total force that was applied to that. Friction and my, my force combined. Now, what's the other thing that the acceleration depends upon? What other thing can affect the amount of acceleration? Was your hand up? No. The mass. The mass of the object. Now let's look at how each of these affect the acceleration of the object. If you apply a bigger net force, you've got a bigger unbalanced force, then what's that going to do to the acceleration? Is that going to make it bigger or smaller? Friction is 20 newtons. I apply a force of 30. My net force will be 10. Okay. Second scenario, friction is 20. I apply a force of 50. My net force is 30. Which one's going to accelerate more? The one with a net force of 10 or the net force of 30? The one with a net force of 30, right? The bigger the net force, the bigger the acceleration. What about mass? You apply a net force of 10 newtons on a mass of 2 kilograms. You apply a net force of 10 newtons on a mass of 30 kilograms. Which one's going to accelerate more? The mass of 2 or the mass of 10? You push the smart car, you push the semi-truck with the same force. Which one's going to accelerate more? Really? The smart car will, right? Or the 2 kilograms in the previous example, right? So the, sm the smaller the mass, the bigger the acceleration. Bigger the force, bigger the acceleration. Bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. We can write that in an equation. Looks well, something like this. A is equal to F over M. Increase force, increase acceleration. Increase mass, decrease acceleration. Now, that is essentially Newton's second law. That equation basically is Newton's second law. But we're going to phrase it in words. We're going to say the acceleration of an object is directly related to the net force. In other words, the bigger the net force, the bigger the acceleration. And it's inversely related to, if I could spell that, and it's inversely related to the mass of the object. Bigger the net force, bigger the acceleration, bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. And as I said just a minute ago, we can write that as an equation that says exactly what the words say, A is equal to F over M. That equation is on your data sheet. That equation will be given to you on quizzes and tests, not your quiz tomorrow, because quiz isn't on this stuff tomorrow future quizzes and tests. But it's not written in that form. On your equation sheet, it's written in this form. F is equal to M times A. And the reason we've done that on your data sheet 
is because that's the form that you use more often. As much as that technically is Newton's second law, we write it like this because we use it that way a little bit more often than we use the definition way, the a is equal to f over m. All right, let's take a look at an example. <clears throat> 3.5, page 149. It says a lacrosse player exerts an average net horizontal force of 2.8 newtons forward. Notice it says a net force of 2.8 newtons. It's not saying that we've got one force of 2.8 and then another force of 0 0.6 and then whatever. Okay, we don't know how many forces we have. Maybe we have 12 forces here. Maybe we have 15 forces acting on this on this lacrosse ball. But in the end, the combined force, the unbalanced force, the net force, is 2.8 newtons. And that's good. That's the one that we need, because that's the one that our Newton's second law equation uses, the net force. On a point 0.14 kilogram lacrosse ball while running within the net of his stick, calculate the average horizontal acceleration of the ball while in contact with the cross net. Let's write down our givens here. We've got a net force. We'll call it F net of 2.8 newtons, and we'll define forward as positive. We've got a mass here of 0 0.14 kilograms, and we're looking for the acceleration. Now, this, I think, looks like a pretty straightforward question, a pretty easy question, right? And really it is, right? We know we're going to use F is equal to M times A, or A is equal to F over M to solve this question. But remember, for this and every other question involving a force, you're allowed to use those equations that you learned last unit as well, if you need them. Okay, just because in this question we don't need them, doesn't mean they're not valid. All of those group B equations are valid. In fact, F equals M times A is just one more group B equation. Group A, V equals D over T, when we have a constant velocity. Group B, all of those five that we learned in unit one, plus F equals MA, they're all now group B equations. This is a group B problem. Okay, we're allowed to use F equals MA or any other group B equation. Let's try this one. 2.8 newtons divided by 0 0.14 kilograms. We do the math there, and we end up getting 20. What would the units for that be? What is it? We can go meters per second squared, right? It's, it's acceleration. Now, there is one more set of units that you could also use here that would be absolutely correct for acceleration. What would it be, Frazier? No, I thought you were going to. Well, we know it's meters per second squared because it's acceleration, and that's the standard units for acceleration. Since we use standard units for force and mass, we get standard units for acceleration. What's the other one we could use, though, Hayden? Newtons per kilogram as well. I would mark both of those correct. They both mean exactly the same thing. Okay, it's not like kilometers per hour and meters per second, where they, where they have different meanings, right? different sets of units. Those two units mean exactly the same thing. Frazier? So, if you Yeah, you should. Yeah, you should. Technically, if it was in grams, and let's say it was 140 grams, we have 2.8 newtons divided by 140 grams, then you would get an answer of, what would that be, 0 0.02, I think? That would not be meters per second squared, but technically you could say newtons per gram. I wouldn't do that, though. I would not do that. Whenever you're dealing with acceleration, um, we want to be in meters per second squared or newtons per kilogram because if we need to use that number further on down the road, okay, it's got to be in the standard units. Okay, so, look, you just solve our constant speed. I don't really care what units you use, but as soon as you introduce acceleration, let's go to the standard units. Meters, seconds, newtons, kilograms, and so on. All right? I'm going to erase that because even though it's correct, I don't want you to do it. Copy that down if you haven't already. All right. Let's see what you can do with these two questions. They should go pretty quickly for you, I think. I will give you a couple minutes, and then we'll go over them if we need to. 
All right, if we don't have any trouble with these, then we're going to move on to our next topic, the topic that we want to cover, the new topic that we want to cover today. The types of forces. So we've defined on Friday what a force is and what a force does. Today we talked about how a force affects the amount of acceleration of the object, right? the rate at which the object speeds up or slows down. And then we're going to extend that to talk about some different types of forces that can act on objects. The first type of force that we're going to talk about is called weight. Weight, literally, the force of gravity that acts on an object. My weight is about 700 newtons. Why do I say my weight is 700 newtons as opposed to 150, 160 pounds? Or why do I say it's 700 newtons as opposed to, say, 70 kilograms? Well, first of all, 70 kilograms doesn't measure weight at all. 70 kilograms measures mass. And mass and weight are two different things. Mass is the amount of matter that's present in something. I have 70 kilograms of matter present in me. And that value of matter, that amount of matter is going to be constant no matter where I go. I can go to New Orleans, which is below sea level, or I can go to the top of Mount Everest. My mass will be exactly the same. I can go to the moon, and my mass will be exactly the same because I have the exact same amount of matter present inside me in New Orleans as I do at the top of Mount Everest, as I do on the moon, as I do in the space shuttle. My mass will be exactly the same. The force of gravity that acts on me, however, won't be exactly the same. In New Orleans, it will be higher than it will be at the top of Mount Everest. The force of gravity acting on me on the moon will be dramatically lower than it is even on the top of Mount Everest. It's only about one-sixth of what it is on Earth. My weight will change dramatically depending upon where I am. Now, why didn't I weigh it, do it in pounds? Pounds measures weight. Why do we see give our weight in newtons as opposed to in, in pounds? Because newtons is metric and pounds isn't. It's like saying, why do we use kilometers per hour for speed as opposed to miles per hour? Because kilometers per hour is metric. Newtons is metric, pounds isn't. So that's one of those units that we still kind of still kind of use the old system for whatever reason. Like a lot of us haven't made that transition to the metric system. You know, what do you weigh? If I say, what do you weigh? You know, you guys are probably going to give me your weight in pounds, okay, which is correct, but it's not metric. If I say, what do you weigh? And you give me your weight in, in kilograms, you're not actually technically correct because that's a mass, not a weight. Technically, you should give me your weight in newtons, the force of gravity, mass times 9.81 meters per second squared. So it's the force of gravity acting on an object. We're going to say it's F is equal to M times, not M times M, that would be right, M times A, where A is neg 9.81 meters per second squared. So if my mass is 70 kilograms, I multiply that by 9.81, I get about 687 newtons. My mass would be 70, my weight would be 687 newtons. Now, technically, that's a negative value, right? Because acceleration is a negative value. But whenever you're asked to find weight, we'll just make it a positive value. We'll take the absolute value of the force of gravity. Now, that's a little bit confusing because probably most of us thought that weight was my 70 kilogram mass five minutes ago. Now we know it's not. 70 kilograms is mass, stays the same no matter where I go. Earth, moon, outer space, doesn't matter. My weight, my force of gravity, mass times 9.81 changes no matter where I am. Normal force is a force of the ground pushing up. I'm going to say the force of the ground in quotation marks 
Because it doesn't actually have to be the ground. Right now, you're sitting at a desk. The normal force is actually provided to you by your desk. As I, st as I stand on the ground, the normal force is provided to me by the ground. If you're on your skateboard, the normal force is provided to you by the skateboard. It's either the ground pushing up on you or it's something that takes the place of the ground pushing up on you. So we're going to define as the force of the ground, in quotation marks, we'll say pushing up, in quotation marks, at 90 degrees. The reason we put up in quotation marks, well, if I'm standing on a hill, the normal force doesn't actually push me straight up. The normal force pushes me at 90 degrees to that hill. So it's like, it's kind of up, but kind of not up, because it's at 90 degrees. Because something like this, right? I'm standing right here. The ground pushes straight up on me. I'm standing right here. The ground pushes up at 90 degrees. What's the deal with this normal force anyways? Well, let's look at it this way. Right now, all of us are either sitting or standing in this room, and none of us are falling through the floor. Would you agree with that? We're all stable on this floor. None of us are falling through the floor, literally, into the ground. I think that's pretty clear. Why aren't we? Because all of us have a force of gravity of somewhere in that 5 to 800 Newton range, depending upon our mass, a force of gravity of somewhere between 5 and 800 newtons acting down. If that's the only force acting on me, that 700 newton force of gravity acting down, then what's going to happen to me? If I've got an unbalanced force, and that is gravity acting down, and that's it, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to go down. Right? If I don't have something pushing up on me with the same force that gravity is pulling down on me, then gravity is going to win and I'm going to go down. If you happen to be in water, let's say your force of gravity is your force of gravity is 700 newtons and the buoyant force in the water is 600 newtons acting up. What's going to happen to you? You're going to start sinking. You're not going to sink at 9.81 meters per second squared, but you're still going to sink. If the buoyant force is 700 newtons acting up, same as gravity pulling down, then what's going to happen to you? You're going to float. We're floating on the Earth right now. We're floating on the ground right now. Gravity pulls down at, let's say, 700 newtons, but the Earth pushes up at 700 newtons as well. It's balanced, and that's why we don't go down, and that's why we don't go up, because those two forces, weight and the normal force, balance each other out. Does that make sense? Here's another one. Friction. Friction is that force that resists motion. There are two kinds of friction. Two kinds of forces that resist motion. Let's think about this. You guys have all experienced both of them before. When you push something on the ground, okay, sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to push, right? You got it sliding, but you got to push really hard because you know intuitively that friction is pushing back. Okay, you have to beat friction. You have to have a force that's bigger than friction in order to accelerate this object, right? We've all experienced that. That's the friction that we call kinetic or dynamic friction. There's another kind of friction, though, that's a little bit harder to deal with. It's called static friction. Static friction is the force of friction that acts on this desk when it's not moving. Right now, the force of static friction on this desk is zero. Because there's, no, there's nothing that friction has to counter here. But if I push on this desk with a force of 10 newtons, and the desk doesn't move, then static friction must be balancing my applied force. Static friction, therefore, must be 10 newtons. 
If I push on the desk with 30 and it still doesn't move, static friction all of a sudden becomes 30. If I push on it with 50 and it still doesn't move, then static friction all of a sudden becomes 50. Static friction is that force of friction that tries to keep an object from beginning to move. Kinetic friction is that force of friction that tries to keep an object from continuing to move. Does that make sense? We're going to say friction is a force between two surfaces that resists motion. There are two types, static and kinetic. Static is the force of friction that tries to keep an object from beginning to move. In other words, it acts on an object that is at rest, and only on an object that is at rest. It tries to keep an object from beginning to move. Versus kinetic friction, which is acting on a moving object. It tries to keep an object from stopping moving. Or it tries to keep an object not from stopping moving. It tries to keep an object from continuing to move. We'll talk more about friction tomorrow. That's a whole other lesson on friction. But I just want to spend just another minute or so on it here. You guys have all experienced this before as well. Static friction, its value changes. Kinetic friction, it doesn't. If I'm pushing on something um, with a force of 50 newtons and it's moving, then kinetic friction will be the same whether I push on it with 50 newtons or whether I push on it with 100 newtons. Stat kinetic friction isn't going to change its value. But static friction will. The force of static friction on this desk right now is zero. I push on it with 10 newtons, it doesn't move. Static friction is 10 newtons. I push on it with 20 newtons, it doesn't move. Static friction becomes 20 newtons. Static friction is always the same value of force as you're applying until it reaches a maximum value. I push on it with 10, doesn't move. Static friction is 10. 20, doesn't move. Static friction is 20. 21, the desk moves. What kind of friction do I have now that the desk is moving? It, it's kinetic friction, good. It's not static anymore. The maximum static friction was 20 newtons. The value of static friction changed. However hard I pushed it, it matched my applied force. Until I exceeded the maximum value of 20, and then it started moving, and then kinetic friction took over. Kinetic friction kicked in. Kinetic friction will always be less than the maximum value of static friction. What that means is, listen carefully here, what that means is it's always easier to keep something moving than it is to get something moving. It's always easier to keep something moving than to get something moving. Let's think about that. You get this big dresser that you're trying to push across the floor because you're trying to clean behind it or whatever. You guys know sometimes those things are heavy, like big hardwood dressers. They're heavy. You got to push it. You can't get it moving. You can't get it moving. Can't get it moving. Finally, you get it moving. Once it's moving, it's easier to push now, isn't it? It's easier to keep it moving than it was to get it moving. Because kinetic friction will always be less than the maximum value of static friction. That's why, hey, when I was younger and learned to drive, um, when I was your age and learned to drive, um, anti-lock brakes were just kind of, just kind of becoming popular and becoming a, you know, a relatively standard safety feature in cars. Now it's, uh, I mean, every single, the cheapest cars have anti-lock brakes now because they're a huge safety bonus on a car. 
Anti-lock bridge. When I was younger, um, I was taught if you hit a patch of ice, okay, pump the brakes. If you hit a patch of, of ice, pump the brakes so you don't skid. Now you don't do that. Okay, now if you hit a patch of ice, you put your foot on the brake and you keep it there. Well, I was taught to pump the brakes because we didn't want the brakes to lock. Okay, you're to, uh, taught not to pump the brakes because anti-lock brakes automatically keep the brakes from locking. Anti-lock brakes pump it for you. They pump it several times per second for you. Well, what's the benefit of that? Wouldn't it be better just to keep your foot on the brake? Wouldn't you get more braking force if your foot stayed on the brake versus you pumping it? No. Because if you keep your foot on the brake and you lock your wheels, then you're going to start skidding. When you start skidding, okay, you've got what we call kinetic friction. The tire rubs against the road, sliding against the road, and that's kinetic friction. That's a value of friction which will eventually stop you. But if you pump the brakes, or if you have anti-lock brakes, which every car has now, then the wheel doesn't actually skid. The wheel keeps turning, which is a good thing. Because as the wheel keeps turning, each spot on the wheel maintains its position on the road. Which means we don't have kinetic friction. We have static friction. The wheel isn't sliding. It's static friction. Which friction is bigger, kinetic or static? Static. What's better to have when you're trying to stop your car, kinetic or static? Static, because it's a bigger force. Kinetic or sliding friction will stop your car, but static friction, where your wheel doesn't slide, will stop your car quicker. Okay, we'll spend some more time on friction tomorrow, including some equations. One more little thing here. This is not a, a, a type of force here. A free body diagram is simply a diagram, a picture, that shows all forces acting on an object. If we're going to start analyzing multiple forces, then we need to be able to represent all of those forces that are acting on the object. We do that with a free body diagram. Sometimes they call that free body diagram an FBD. We're going to do one question. Unfortunately, it's not in your book, so I'm going to have to ask you to copy this one down. Do one example that's going to show you how to draw a free body diagram. It's going to show you how to draw all of these forces acting on an object. Then, in a couple of days, we'll see what we can actually do with these diagrams. All right, let's take a look here now. It says, draw a free body diagram of a 20 kilogram object that's sliding along a horizontal surface. It's pushed with an applied force of 30 newtons and restricted by a frictional force of 10 newtons. Here's the object. It doesn't really matter whether we draw it as a box or maybe it's a toy car or it's a, it's a little toy a doll or it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what shape we draw it as. as okay, we're not trying to represent you know, this beautiful artistic representation of the object. We're trying to represent the forces that are acting on this object. So there's my box. <coughs> has a mass of 20 kilograms. I'm labeling that, although technically, that's not part of a free body diagram. Free body diagrams show forces, not masses. But look, we know we're going to have to write down givens if we're actually solving a problem. So drawing a diagram with forces, we might as well show everything, including the mass, even though it's technically not part of the free body diagram. It's just another given. We have an applied force of 30 newtons. We'll assume that that applied force is to the right. I'm going to label that FA, 30 newtons. It's resisted by a frictional force of 10 newtons. Now, is this going to be static friction or kinetic friction? 
And how do we know them? Draw a free body diagram of an object that is sliding along a surface. Static or kinetic? It's kinetic because it's moving, right? It's sliding, it's moving. It's kinetic friction, and its value is 10 newtons. We know that that force of friction is a value that's about thir a third of the applied force. Therefore, we should draw the vector about a third as long, roughly. We also know that that force of friction has to oppose the way that it's pushed. Look, if it's moving to the right, friction has to act to the left. Friction always opposes motion, so it's always going to be opposite to the way that it's moving. Is that it? Done? That was easy, right? Are we missing anything? I probably wouldn't have asked you that question if we weren't, right? Frazier? Um, well, the net force is actually all the forces combined, so we don't need to draw in the net force. It's all of them combined. Yep. Good. You're missing the weight, which is the force of gravity, and the normal force. Now, the weight is going to act down. And we don't know the value of the weight or the force of gravity. So it's not critical that you have that drawn to scale relative to the applied force. I'm drawing it longer than the applied force because I know the force of gravity is bigger than 30 newtons here. Now, if we have a force of gravity acting down, then we must have a normal force acting up. Which one's bigger, gravity or normal? They got to be the same. If it wasn't the same, what would be happening to this object? If gravity was bigger, what would happen? Well, it would be going down into the ground. If the normal force is bigger, what would be happening? It would go up, right? It would accelerate upward. Is there ever a situation where the normal force is bigger than gravity? Maybe on a trampoline, as it pushes you up, right? You wouldn't go up if the normal force wasn't bigger. Another one, a simple example, is an elevator. Stand in an elevator, if you accelerate upward, the normal force must have been bigger than gravity. Otherwise, you wouldn't have accelerated upward. These two forces in red end up canceling each other in this case because they're the same value. It's the green forces that we'd be concerned with here. Is that okay? All right, so we've set the stage today for some stuff that we're doing over the next couple of days. The first one being friction. Talk about static and kinetic friction in more detail tomorrow. Spend some time with the equations. You had to find those values. And the second thing being the free body diagrams and what we're going to do with those free body diagrams and all of these other forces that we've learned to find today. All right, your homework, and you've got the next 15 minutes to work on this already. You might even get it finished up here before class is over. It's just a worksheet on Newton's second law. There's only five questions, although a couple of them have two parts. See what you can do with these. Show your work. Okay. Recognize that if it's accelerating, it's a group B problem but that f is equal to m times a is another equation that we're allowed to use along with our group B equations that we learned in the last unit. Okay, we'll hand these out, get to work on them, and then we'll check them over tomorrow.